And the idea is that I can pause at the end of each one of those parts and take questions that has to do with what we just talked about. I will try to control the time as best we can. And the final thing is, I'm not sure that there's been a time since about 1950, at the start of the jet age, when there are as many technologies at play in aerospace as there are right now. And that's both exciting and challenging. Which ones are gonna be there? What matters? And I'm gonna give you my opinion. I will guarantee you that I do not have all the answers. So don't believe that just because I said it, it's right. But I will tell you what I believe and hopefully I can tell you why I believe that. And sort of the, the uh, bottom line, in the right direction, <clears throat> maybe, Are we doing good now? Okay, we'll try now. There we go. What I really want to talk about is to understand both what can be and what should be. And there's a lot of work here that can be. And there's also a fair amount of stuff that shouldn't be. And hopefully I can get to that. So the, I really want the first part of this is about energy. What is the source of energy for flight? And there's a lot going on here. And in the popular media right now, there is a ton of stuff about hydrogen. Rolls-Royce just ran an engine on hydrogen. Got a lot of press coverage. Airbus has talked about hydrogen powered airplanes. So, if you, if you look in the popular press, tremendous amount about hydrogen. This is one of those blank slides. So let's talk about hydrogen. Let's talk about batteries. And let's talk about more conventional fuels. At first glance, if you read any of the articles about hydrogen, somewhere in the first paragraph, it will say, this is the perfect fuel. The only products of combustion are water and heat. What could be better than that? What I need you to understand is that hydrogen is not a fuel. It is an energy carrier. It looks just like a battery. It takes energy to produce it, and you can get energy back out again. The problem is that Everybody who is a proponent of hydrogen wants you to use green hydrogen. Hydrogen comes in three different colors. It comes in gray, blue, and green. Gray hydrogen is produced from methane and has a byproduct of carbon dioxide, which if you're interested in the environment is not a great idea. Blue hydrogen is produced from methane, but the CO2 is captured. So it's better. Green hydrogen is produced by electrolysis. And everybody says, what you really wanna do is use sustainable power and produce green hydrogen. Some numbers to play with. If I take sustainable electricity, put it into the battery of an electric car, and drive that car, and I look at the front to back efficiency all the way through that process, it's about 85%, pretty darn good. If I look at production of hydrogen going into a tank, running a fuel cell, which drives the electric vehicle, the efficiency is about 35%. Making hydrogen is not a particularly efficient process. And then on top of that, if you say, okay, right now in the world today, about 17% of our power is generated from sustainable sources. Do I want to use it to produce hydrogen inefficiently, or do I want to use that sustainable electricity 
efficiently. My, my take is the best answer from an environmental standpoint, from an energy standpoint is hydrogen is not the answer. Even though it looks really neat on paper and you get this, it only makes water. So if it's not, if it's not hydrogen, what about batteries? As we just proved, batteries are more efficient than hydrogen. However, they're heavy. Today, current technology, from an energy density standpoint, batteries are about 45 times worse than jet fuel. Same weight of jet fuel produces 45% more, 45 times more energy. And so you get some really interesting calculations. Um, one of the ones I saw the other day was if I if I put amount of batteries into a 747 and to replace the amount of fuel that the 47 carries, you could have about 20, 20 minutes of sustained flight. And if you look at most electric airplanes, the best that you're seeing is half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, now, anybody that's designed an airplane knows that weight is absolutely crucial. So taking something that weighs a lot and saying that's a great source probably is not a good answer. That takes us to the next question. So what are you gonna do? The interesting one is probably what's called SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel. Uh, it can be produced, can be, big emphasis on can, in a way that is net carbon zero, or even potentially slightly net carbon negative. But it is not an easy process, and it's expensive. The advantage is SAF is, is what they call a drop-in solution. I can put it into an airplane that exists today and run that, that airplane. And we're making progress in that direction. Can you get the cost down? That's the question. If you start with the assumption that says, we do want to do a better job of the environment, of those three, the only one that I see that has real long-term potential right now is SAM. And that's not what you're seeing in most of the, of the popular press. That's section one, that's energy. Any quick questions people have before I leave that subject? What is SAF exactly? Sustainable aviation fuel is derived out of biomass. The best of them are out of algae, saltwater algae, uh, because they actually come out net carbon negative. They absorb enough oxygen that by the time you're done, you're actually net negative. But, and we spend a lot of time on this question because uh, one of the things you do not want to do is do what they did with ethanol the first time around, which is, ah, good, we'll go divert corn crops to producing uh, SAF, which you can do. You can, you can go through an ethanol cycle to get it. Uh, but you, but most of the measurements that people are doing today say, if you displace food crops, it counts against you, which it should. So biomass is the is the most fundamental source. Yeah. When you use SAF, what is the floor of the aircraft that you would need necessary to dissipate the kinetic energy as it comes down? In other words, can you use it in middle mile air taxis or less mile aircraft, or does it need to only be in commercial aircraft? No, it, 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 it behaves just like jet fuel. So anywhere you can use jet fuel, you, you can use it. So you can use it in a small, small turbine. You know, potentially you could drive aviation gas that way too. It's probably not a big enough market to do, but you could. So any small turbine, and, you know, there are some really interesting, we can talk about them some more. You know, what if you did a hybrid kind of airplane? 
it did have some batteries, but that little gas turbine that was operating right at a single and its best optimum speed all of the time, driving a generator. So it doesn't have to go to idle, doesn't have to have acceleration characteristics. There's a lot of stuff on a jet engine today that's there so I can change speed. What if I had it at an optimum point? Would a hybrid technology look good? I think that's worth pursuing. It's worth thinking about. And you're saying that it's less explosive than jet fuel and it falls on unsheltered humans? Say it again. Is it less explosive than jet fuel on unsheltered humans? The reason we don't use fuel in our last mile and middle mile drones is because of the explosive power of jet fuel. So that's why I'm trying to figure out what would be the, the floor of the aircraft that could use this fuel. Um, I don't see any reason you can't use it. I'm, I'm just wondering how explosive it is. How explosive? Yes. Um, you know, jet fuel itself is not that bad. It doesn't have the kind of flashpoint. You know, it's still fuel. It still burns, but um, compared to a lot of other things, by the way, compared to hydrogen, which has significant problems. <laughs> so, but no, I, I, think, I think it's useful. Okay. I, I really do. Yeah. What happens if you have, like, say you have a hydrogen battery or a normal battery? One, we would just put it in an aircraft, and two, if you put it in, say, the what is cargo hold or belly of an aircraft, and it had to fail your capsule on fire or whatever, instead of your engine having a problem, you could shut that off, pull the fire extinguisher, you're fine. Then your whole belly of the aircraft is on fire, correct? That's yep. an issue. No, the battery and battery safety is an issue that you do have to deal with without without question. Um, I have a request. Hmm? Of the ones asking the questions, could you project your voice a little yeah. more? It's a big room. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to repeat questions too. So it'd be really nice for everybody to hear the questions. Yeah. So, what about battery? Battery safety. You put them in the cargo hold. What happens if you have a fire? There's one other thing before we leave batteries. Uh, it's sort of interesting. One of the characteristics of a fuel airplane is the weight decreases during the mission. Battery airplane, the weight does not decrease during the mission. You're carrying the same amount at the end of the mission as you are at the start. Okay, I'm going to move to the next one. <laughs> For those of you who are old enough, you'll recognize the Jetsons. <laughs> this is the dream. This is what everybody really would love to do. You know, you walk out your front door, you climb in your in your little flying vehicle and off you go. And all of a sudden, it sort of looks like maybe we could do that. This is a, little, a vehicle, this is called Air One. Um, two place vehicle, um, electric, batteries, um, wings fold, the arms that carry the rotors fold, you can park it in your garage. You know, this is, a step to the Jetsons. There it is on your little landing pad in front of your house. <laughs> What's the problem? Well, there are a number of them. So here's a comparison. And these are two airplanes I know pretty well. There's the air one up there. This is an Icon A5. They're both made out of carbon fiber. They both seat two people. Um, this one happens to be able to land on water. The wings full, you can park it in your garage. Wings full, park it in your garage. There are some numbers that are sort of telling. Installed power on the Air One, 771 horsepower. Installed power on the A5, 100 horsepower. <clears throat> In the advertisement for the Air One, it says it's a really neat airplane because at cruise, it only takes 100 horsepower because you're using the wings to carry the lift. Taking off vertically is not cheap. I went to a seminar many, many years ago in which 
a VTOL advocate, got really excited. And he said, the neat thing about VTOL is if you give me 500 feet of runway, I can double the payload. Give me another 100 feet of runway, I can quadruple the payload. Wings are way more efficient than vertical lift. What it says is, if I need to be vertical, do it, but recognize it's expensive. One of the things that they advertise, and if you go to their webpage, it's very exciting. So this is really cool, this airplane. I can go to my favorite fishing spot. 96 miles of range. Well, unless your fishing spot has a charging port, <laughs> I've got two vertical takeoffs, two vertical landings. I have a net effective range of 30 miles. So your fishing spot's got to be within 30 miles. <laughs> and then comes what I think may be the biggest problem. This happens to be Seattle. Um, that big blue thing in the middle is a class B airspace, controlled airspace. If I want to fly anywhere in there, I have to be talking to air traffic control. Right now today, I looked it up this morning. There are 17 NOTAMs for Seattle. NOTAMs used to be called Notice to Airmen. But obviously, we can't do that anymore. So now it's called notice to air missions. Um, but if I'm going to fly in that general vicinity, I've got to be really capable not for flying the airplane. I, I've flown the A5 or the aircraft. I know how to do that. I can fly it pretty well. Would I fly in controlled airspace for that airplane? The answer is absolutely no. <clears throat> all the things I need to know to operate in a controlled environment are way above my current capability. Do I really want to have several thousand of these zipping around? And oh, by the way, I'm supposed to always stay at least a thousand feet above any obstacle. And I've got, if I'm flying visual flight rules, I've got to stay below altitudes in here, and I've got to be able to avoid and know where everybody else is. And then the last interesting piece, when the Icon A5 first came out, it was advertised that it would cost about $150,000. Interestingly, the current webpage for the Air One says it'll cost about $150,000. An A5 today, now that they figured out how life really works, sells for $389,000. And the Air One is more complicated, has more capability in it, both of them carbon fiber, uh, one of them with a pretty simple little engine, one of them with eight electrical engines, batteries, batteries the size of a Tesla. Um, my best guess is that's a half million dollar vehicle. So can it be, the answer is absolutely yes. Can that airplane be? No question. Should it be? Much bigger question. So what, are, what, what about the rest of air mobility? This happens to be a uh, Lilium jet. Uh, these are, airplanes are normally designed for either four or six people. That one happens to be six. Uh, it's a really fascinating design. Uh, again, batteries, all of these tilt so that they go to 90 degrees so it can hover. Transition to wingborne flight. Um, there are lots of guys doing it. That happens to be vertical aerospace. Joby, Archer, there are actually over 200 designs out there right now, people trying to build them. The, the challenge to me isn't, again, will they work? They will work. The challenge sits right here. 
This is what is imagined as a typical Verde port. So you've got two, there's, if, if you complete the pictures, there's another landing zone over here, landing takeoff zone. There are eight parking spots. Um, I can put maybe 400 passengers a day through this vertical. Let me give you some numbers just to, to try to put this in perspective. There are about 600,000 people who commute into New York City every day. If I want to touch 10% of them, that's 60,000 people. If I'm going to try to do that in four passenger vehicles, I need a lot of landing spots. I've got four. And people say, well, you can land on building tops. Well, it turns out most of those buildings have their HVAC on top. So maybe I can modify it. Well, if I've got a 5,000 person building, I can probably get somewhere around 45 people an hour under that building. What it says to me is there will, these will fly. They will fly from New York to JFK, to Newark, to LaGuardia, and they will transport about two tenths of 1% of the passenger traffic to those airports. It will be what I would call a premium service. It will be the airlines will buy it because they can transport their first class passengers that way. But is it really urban air mobility? And I would argue that we have not found that solution yet. We don't know how to transport large numbers of people in four or six passenger vehicles. One of the other things that comes out of this that's really interesting is if, if I make that terminal big enough to have more passenger throughput, I get a runway for free because I have enough slots that now if I just have a strip in front of it, I've got a, I've got a place to land and take off. So is vertical really an advantage or a mass transportation system? I think I see in the cards that happening. William, the one I showed, is that, that airplane right there, is now changing their acronym. And they are talking about regional air mobility. So you can go from New York to Philadelphia or to Scranton, Pennsylvania, or something like that. So the, the process is developing. We'll get some good, interesting views. I would, again, not be surprised to see some of them starting to go hybrid rather than just batteries, so they can begin to get some range. So before we leave vehicles, I want to go run up to the other end. What about supersonic? That happens to be another airplane I know quite well. That's boom, supersonic. That's a 55 passenger supersonic airplane. Technically very achievable. The issue again is economics. Um, it will burn more fuel. They have said that it will be 100% SAF. Right now SAF is more expensive than jet <laughs> and you get a passenger demand to make it interesting. I think the answer is probably yes. I think what NASA is doing right now with the X-59 airplane, where they're looking at sonic boom and how one might reduce it is gonna be a really interesting thing. If I had to bet today, I would bet that we will end up with a noise regulation rather than an outright, outright ban of supersonic travel over land. If your noise level is below a certain level, you're okay. If you're above that, you're not. Just like the noise rules for takeoff and landing. Uh, and I think the NASA program will produce those kind of numbers. You're at this level, you can fly over land. If that happens, then supersonic gets interesting. So, 
My view is probably, but certainly not a slam dunk. This is the Mach 5 plus transport. Um, really, really, really interesting technical problem because it's a, a uh, dual cycle engine. It's a gas turbine at low speed and a scramjet at high speed. Can you do that? What are the real economics of going Mach 5? Um, does it make any sense at all? Uh, I think that's a much tougher problem than a Mach 1.7 supersonic transport. I don't expect I would ever fly in this airplane, not because I wouldn't fly in it, but because it's not going to be in my lifetime. Will we get there? No, no. If I had to bet, the answer would be that that's a really tough. So, bottom line, where do I see vehicles going? I think we will get better regional airplanes. They are probably not going to be just battery powered airplanes because the economics just don't work. It might be hybrid. There's some real great academic work that can be done around what's a great hybrid cycle, how much battery, how much engine, how does that fit together? I think we will probably see supersonic, but it'll be all first class. It'll be a premium product. I think we will see some of those B2L machines. They will be a premium product, not a mass product. Uh, and it'll be a long time before we see hypersonic. That's our real fast tour through airplanes. What about blimps? <laughs> What about blimps? Uh, in my computer deck that goes with this speech is a picture of one. Just I decided I didn't have enough time to talk about all of them. Um, There's some interesting stuff around cargo that, that might make sense. They're never going to be fast. Um, I also have a picture of one which is... Um, for lack of a better word, is a flying hotel that allows you to view the world sort of like a railroad journey. Um, weather will always be a problem. There are a lot of people working on blimps. Um, my guess is that 15 years from now, there'll still be a lot of people working on blimps. I don't, I don't think, I don't think the cargo answer solves that, makes the economics work. But that's just me. I can told you, I don't have all the answers. Just that, that would be my bet. Yeah. Hi, Phil. Scott Hamilton with Liam News. Uh, the Boom SST, Pratt, Whitney, Rolls Royce, GE, Saffron, all said no to the engine. And Blake Scholl has come up with a triumvirate, if you will, of people who have never made a big engine. Give me your, your thoughts about that. Um, I'm actually rather interested. I can understand exactly why Rolls, GE, and Pratt said no. It, it's a niche market. I've got a lot of bigger stuff I can do. Um, Florida Turbine Technologies has built a lot of little jet engines. And these are not that big. I mean, they're 35,000 pound thrust engines, but they're not huge. They're not 90,000 pound thrust engines. And, uh, you know, I was surprised because I went and dug into what, what is practice done, the one that owns Florida Turbine Technologies. You know, and they're, they're flying an autonomous vehicle that they designed and built. There's a lot of technology in that company. Um, I'll say it carefully here. I'm a fan of SpaceX. I, I think what they have done is absolutely amazing. And to say that you know, they, they didn't take an existing rocket engine 
to do Falcon 9. And yet they've got the most reliable vehicle out there. So I, I think this may actually be a good answer. That's just me. So why did uh, Boeing never pursue the supersonic transport program into service? Um, why did Boeing not pursue the supersonic transport program? There, there are two ways to try to attack that market. And the, sort of the basic ground rule at that point was what you really want to do is get the operating cost per passenger down by getting more passengers. So you kept trying to make it bigger. And if you looked at old Boeing designs, they were all dual class or three class, first class, business class, um, economy. If you run the numbers, economy never makes it. It just won't pay. And so I felt for a very long time, if you were ever going to have a successful one, the Concord was closer by saying it's an all first class airplane. And my guess is smaller is better than bigger because I get flexibility out of that. And, you know, if I can fly it from Atlanta to Munich or New York to Barcelona, I, I want a smaller airplane because I'm, I want to attack, attract that premium market. I don't want to try to build one that has the economics that, because you're not going to compete with a 777 or an A350. How long do you think it would take to develop and mature um, the manufacturing process for SAF for it to be usable? That's a really neat question. It's a, the question was, how long will it be before we have a good, robust production process for SAF? Uh, I think we're closer. And I'm going to say this with, with a little bit of care, but governments do really interesting things. So if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really about climate, there are incentives in there for hydrogen. I think that I think that's wasted money. There are some incentives in there for SAF. I think that probably is good money. Um, I suspect, like a lot of things that have driven aviation in the past, you know, if you say, okay, here's the rule. You've got to have um, carbon numbers that are here. Then all of a sudden, people start investing in SAF because that's how I'm going to get there. Um, when you said, I need the noise to come down, we ran out, so everybody ran around and said, you can't do that and then figured out how to go do it. So, you know, I, I think it is building incentives and it'll get done. And there are a bunch of people out there now trying to figure that, your, answer your question right now. Yeah. How do you think boom will be affected uh, in terms of airports it can use? Because Concord, it had afterburn, so it was limited right. by the annoyance that caused, but boom won't. Who do right. you think that will still cause a problem? So boom is being designed to meet current noise standards. Take off and landing noise standards. Um, it is a bypass ratio engine, not an afterburning engine. Um, and you know, the honest answer is if you don't meet the noise standards, it isn't going to be successful. You've got it. It will not be allowed to have other noise results. It just it's got to meet the noise standards. Period. So, so it's like a seven three seven. Just like a three seven, four seven, any other airplane. Yeah. It sounds like you're generally pretty bullish on Boom as a company, but do you think there's any way that anything they make flies in the next 15 to 20 years? Yes. I think it's, I don't think it's easy, but yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, I sat in the simulator for the XV1, their technology demonstrator. I, I flew the simulator for what it's worth. Um, the engineering that I've seen is pretty solid. Uh, they're not without risk, but I, I think it can be done. 
What do you think the market size is for Boom? Blake is very optimistic, talking about 600 routes. Some of them seem pretty ambitious. Uh, again, it, it comes down to the economics. How good is it? Uh, and also, you know, if you can get to overland, it changes that number dramatically. Um, you know, I, again, it, it, it's why, why would a GE not want to do the engine? Well, it probably is small, but it might be big. But if I have my options of doing something I'm sure is big, I'm going to do something that I'm more sure of than, than something that's a bit speculative. And that's that, that's speculative. Yeah. On the just a little bit of a different question on the efficiency end of the scale, do you see any, uh, any thoughts on uh, leveraging the ground effect or cargo type? So I love these questions because, again, in my computer, there's a picture of a ground effect cargo vehicle. Um, there, everybody that's tried to go down that path hasn't, hasn't gotten to the far end. It's not easy. Um, does it make sense? I, I think flexibility is a big negative. I can only, there are only, there are limited routes where I can make that, that work. Uh, now, you know, Seattle to Tokyo, it work. Um, Seattle to Beijing clearly doesn't work. Um, so, <clears throat> can I make it fit? Don't know. But if, again, if I were, if I were betting, I'd not, I probably wouldn't bet on not that it can't be done again. I think it can. Um, okay, we're going to phase three here. This one has one slide and then a lot of talk. That is a Boeing built autonomous tanker. The one in front. <laughs> the one in back is obviously got people in it. Interesting challenge. If you were to go and ask aviators, what's the toughest piloting task there is? Going on board a carrier. That would be it. That autonomous vehicle takes off from a carrier and lands on a carrier. It's a great task for an autonomous vehicle to start with. You don't really want to waste crude airplanes with added fuel tanks going up to refuel other fighters. If I can do that job autonomously, I save a lot of crew, save a lot of, a lot of cost. Here's where technology to me really gets interesting. And there are a bunch of factors coming together in one place. One, we clearly do not have enough pilots. And training new pilots is a tough job. The US has been good at it with very high standards. A lot of hours before you become an airline pilot. Other countries have been a little less rigorous and that has caused some problems. So we have a demand for pilots that exceeds our capability. And oh, by the way, if those uh, little six passenger, four passenger vehicles, each one of them that comes with a pilot in it happen, your pilot shortage just got way worse. So that's one. Number two, the data says that when an airplane has a problem, the pilots have between 10 and 15 seconds to make the correct decision. That is really hard. Example, um, Air France 447, A330 flying out of Rio to Paris. In cruise, iced up pedos, lost their airspeed. When the airspeed gets lost, the autopilot disconnects. 
Um, I didn't do the right thing, and there's 10 seconds, and the airplane's lost. If you look at the 3 7 Max, you see some of the same kind of characteristics. Got a problem? Did you do the right thing? And there's a lot of data down that line. FAA just said, on one hand, uh, pilots ought to be able to fly the airplanes without the computers. Well, just to make this conversation interesting, those little EV2Ls, computers, their entire stabilization system is computer dependent. So if they're gonna happen, we're gonna have to certify airplanes that are computer dependent. Military is building autonomous vehicles that can do pretty difficult things. If I had to bet today, we are on a path to autonomous flight. My view is it's actually easier than autonomous cars. It is an environment that is, because of the way it's been designed, controlled. So I'm going to operate in, a, in an environment that can, in fact, be controlled. How do we get there? If I had to bet right now, I'd say the first step is you go to single pilot and you change their name. You are now a flight manager, not a pilot. Your job is not to move a control stick or a wheel. You are to supervise the actions of the airplane. When the, you get a, you know, right now in the air traffic system, we get verbal commands um, until we get a reliable data linked all digital command system. Somebody's got to hear the commands and say, okay, I'm cleared to by level 350. <coughs> Turn the dial and sets the altitude. Uh, there are some other little pieces that are all playing in this puzzle. Garmin has a system today for things like King Air's smaller airplanes, which is a button in the cockpit, which is if something happens to the pilot, somebody else can push the button and it takes the airplane to the nearest suitable airport, flies it there and lands it. Um, interestingly, you can't prove that it is one in a billion, which is what the standard is for systems, but it's way better than not having something at all. The FAA certified it on that, on that basis. If I go back and look at those EBTOLs, most of them are talking about wanting to be autonomous at a point in the future. One of them is talking about being autonomous from the start. It's WISC, happens to have Boeing investment in it. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that maybe that's a platform for understanding autonomous flight, not for carrying four passengers. I would argue that we're going to get there one way or another. It's why, by the way, AI, machine learning, system reliability get to be really, really important. It's a huge step. And just so everybody understands where I'm coming from, I spent my entire career from the time I started all the way to the end, firmly believing that the ultimate authority in the flight deck was the pilot. That was your most reliable system. The data today says that may not be the case. I may be able to build a more reliable system around an autonomous structure, which is a huge statement. Okay, that's the end of number three. So if you have questions, that go there. Scott? 
you talk about either a single pilot or autonomous, but you look at US Air 1549, United 232, United 811, Qantas 32, you needed a whole bunch of pilots to solve those problems. I, I'm, I'm real skeptical about a single or autonomous. A lot of people are, um, but the, the answer is we are advancing the state of the art at a rate right now, which starts to say we can get there. You can be as dubious as you want to be. I, you know, the fact that you can put an airplane onto a carrier deck autonomously says something pretty important to me. Like I said, I spent my whole career believing the other. So this is not an easy, this is not an easy transition for me. I think it's real. Um, so just to follow up on, on the carrier MQ-25, is that completely autonomous or is there somebody on the carrier working a joystick? No, it's not being flown. It's, it's completely autonomous. autonomous. Now, you can task it. And, and you know, that's sort of where this process is going. I can say, I want you to go from here to there. I want you to go there and orbit because you're going to refuel up there. So I'm, I can task it. I can change the task. I can decide I want it to go to a different place to refuel, but I'm not flying it. Do you think autonomous could go anywhere in the world? Would be more achievable? in certain airspace over others. For instance, you just said um, a carrier. Right. No one else is flying around. So at least you don't intersect airplanes. So would you say airspace that has less airplanes? No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think it is, and, and it's, it's the reason by the way that I said, you go to one first. I think it's really hard to go to take a step from two to zero, but, you know, and, and this is fundamentally a reliability challenge. How, how do I build a system reliable enough to do this? There are a whole bunch of people out there now saying, for example, well, all of these um, EVs or others, they are all computer dependent. If you lose that system, you're, you're toast. So, and like I said, in many ways, it's way easier than, than a car. You know, with a car, somebody can put up a barrier that wasn't there yesterday. The air traffic system doesn't do that. I know where everything is. Um, my bottom line is, I think that's the challenge, Adams. I think that's the big one. And I think that's... We're going, to, we're going to learn a lot. Yeah. Do you think autonomous commercial flight would noticeably decrease um, plane costs, the ticket costs for passengers? Uh, step one, slightly. I'm going from two to one. Um, but, and again, I'll, I'll use the military example. If you step back and you say, okay, what does that airplane not have? Not only does it not have a pilot, but it doesn't have all of the environmental systems that keep a pilot alive. It doesn't have to have the same kind of physical protection for the pilot. It doesn't have to have an ejection seat. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that now doesn't have to be in there. When you go to one, that hasn't that doesn't change. When you go to zero, it changes a lot. Now you can't if you, if the airplane's been designed for one, and you go to zero because you now can, you don't get that saving. There's still all the stuff that was there. You can only get it when you actually end up designing for zero. Now, by the way, just so it's very clear. I've had this discussion with a lot of people, and there are a lot of people who roll their eyes when you start talking about this. But you have to remember, um, we started out with long-range airplanes with five. 
and a pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, navigator, and radio operator. And I can remember when I was in Baldwin, I can remember going from three to two. And it was, oh my God, we, we can't do that. Um, it took a presidential commission to go from three to two. Now nobody even thinks about it. How do you think we can increase public awareness? You know, you talked about some of the technology, like you and I say, most satellites and this and that. How can we best get the message out? You know, here we are, we're talking to people, you know, all of us, the engineers, and we get it, and we're educating the new generation, but we have the sense of public, and they have lawmakers. You know, what do you think is. I think that's a, so that is a phenomenally important question. It really is. Um, like I said earlier, just in one comment, you know, if you go, go read that uh, inflation reduction action bill, there are, there are incentives in there to produce hydrogen. And you say, does that make any engineering sense? Well, I can probably say that here. When you get a whole bunch of lawyers deciding what you ought to do technically, you get the wrong answer. <laughs> we, we, the technical community needs to do more than publish in technical journals. We need to get in front of some of the, what I would call popular press. It's really fascinating. I read an article two days ago. It's the first time I've, I've seen this with an environmentalist saying, this idea of hydrogen is not such a good idea. Most of them have been saying it's a great idea because it you know, only makes water. It's great. This one said, correctly in my view, Maybe we shouldn't be using a limited amount of sustainable electrical energy to do inefficiently produce hydrogen. Well, how do you how do you get that kind of technical knowledge out there? You know, we've got to talk, my view, we've got to talk to the popular press. We've got to say, here's here are the things that are going on, here's what makes sense, here's what doesn't, here's why that the case. I think that's our responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Given all the predictions that we've made and future looking predictions, you had some money to invest in 20 or 30 year outlook. <laughs> 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 uh, what areas, let's say a specific company, what areas do you think? Um, Could you repeat that? Yeah. So the question was, <laughs> if I was going to invest for the next 20 or 30 years, where would I put my money? Yeah, in, in the Um. Yeah, right. <laughs> and where I put it, and I, I said this out loud, so it's okay. I just said it's bad in the university. Um, one of them would be in the area of autonomy. Who's working on it? And I put money there. One of the things that was fascinating about my job, and it still amazes me, is that you had to think out at least 30 years and preferably 50. Here's the 470, about to deliver the last one, 53 years after the first year. 53 years in production. I mean, we're, we're talking about high-tech business and we're talking about a product that lasts half a century. Um, so you've got to be thinking out that far. And, and you know, if you said, do I want a quarterly return? Uh, stuff I'm talking about here is not quarter. This is, this is exactly your number. It's 20 or 30 years. Um, and I, SAF would be my other one. You know, why did I look at hydrogen? Why did I look at batteries? It was because if it's going to be the right thing, we ought to, you know, that's where you put your money. And my conclusion is, you know, people say, well, batteries are going to get better. Yeah, but you're starting out a factor of 45 on the bad side, making a 10% improvement. Isn't it? Isn't going to change the answer. So those would be my two autonomy and SAF. Oh, 
along the line of these like really long product development cycles and looking very far into the future, do you think Boeing is in a place right now where they're headed in the right direction? And if not, what would you say is the best approach for riding the ship? So I got to be real careful. I mean, I've, been, I've been retired for almost two decades. Um, I, I, I think there are some things that I have heard, observed, that I agree with. Uh, SAM as a place to go is one of those. I think I think it's important for going to do some real honest to God product development because over time you lose skill. If you don't if you don't do things, you lose your capability to do it. And um, I think I think it's important that and the skills get exercised. Yeah. Uh, going back a ways to the older I bypass fans that already remember from the late 80s to the Long Beach and we were demonstrating flying around full scale penetrator. We basically work, but right. never were produced because it's other thing. Do you think there's still a chance for that uh, with all the developments that happened with gear changes and things like that? So, yeah, I, you know, I think I think there still is room for open rotor designs. There's some out there that people are working on. I, I keep really trying to think my way through hybrid and where does it go? And that and it actually gets tangled up in that question. What's the what's the best way to, and to drive the economy? And what do I do with batteries and how do I how do I how do I move energy around an airplane? Um, yeah, there, there are lots of challenges, but, but open rotor certainly is, I don't think it is a, in the classic terminology, I don't think it's a game changer, but it could very well be a good solution. I've seen some airplane designs that have been used. Okay, I hope, we, we've now made it all the way through an hour. Uh, if I have done nothing else, I hope I cause people to think. Um, and sometimes what appears to be obvious is not. And you need to think about what are the economics? Why does it work? What are the real results? Um, I'll give you one last, just for fun. Back, I'll go back to hydrogen where I started. One, hydrogen is leaking. It's really hard to contain it. And most estimates say you'll probably lose five to 10% of it. And some of it will find its way into the upper atmosphere. It turns out that nature's way of dealing with methane in the atmosphere is it gets attacked by HO molecules in the upper atmosphere. If you put hydrogen in the upper atmosphere, the HO molecules attack the hydrogen first and deplete the HO and leave the methane. And methane is four times worse as a greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide is. So it, it isn't even clear that just letting a little hydrogen go doesn't in fact hurt the environment. So it's those kind of, how do you think your way through all of these pieces? What's the front to back efficiency? How do I understand that? That is worth thinking about. With that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We have a gift for you. Thank you for being here. Also, welcome to Chita. Probably the team. Um, yes, yes. Um, so this lecture is recorded, and so we will post it up on the department website soon. Um, if if you're willing to, people can stick around, maybe ask a few more questions. Yep. I think there's still a bit of snacks in the back. Um, thank you all for coming. It's very welcome to stay. Thank you. Thank you.